Good evening. I'm Dick Meserve, the president of the Carnegie Institution. And I'd like to welcome you all to a Carnegie Capital Science Evening. Ecology and evolution are deeply in intertwined with each other. Charles Darwin's studies of the distribution of organisms and the operation of natural selection within communities of organisms were springboards for an explosion of ecological research. In fact, the word ecology was coined by a German biologist only a few years after Darwin published his On the Origin of Species. After introducing the word in 1866, Ernst Haeckel wrote, quote, ecology is the study of all those complex interactions referred to by Darwin as the conditions of the struggle for existence. Inherent in the struggle for existence in the theory of natural selection is competition. As populations grow, resources become limited. In the dog-eat-dog -dog world we think of as Darwinism prevails. In reality, things aren't so simple. There is no doubt that competition occurs, but there is also cooperation in the world of nature. Ants and bees are the classic examples. Darwin was very puzzled by these insects, but other organisms cooperate too. Plants and animals don't just co cooperate within their species. What is remarkable is that many organisms, even the lowly bacteria, cooperate with other species. What lessons do these non-human cooperative structures have for us? Can we learn to live, as our guest tonight says, within a sustainable global commons? commons? These are the questions that Professor Simon Levin has long considered. Tonight he will address them as he explores the evolution of cooperation in both non-human and human societies. Professor Levin is the George M. Moffat Professor of Biology at Princeton University and is a pioneer of mathematical ecology. He was one of the first to recognize the power of mathematical models as a means to explore the dynamics of ecological systems. He has shown that the global biosphere is made up of an intricate array of feedback loops operating at many different scales and levels of organization from the microscopic to the macroscopic. His work on pattern and scale in ecology has won him international acclaim. In the 1990s, the paper he wrote on this topic was the most cited scientific paper in the entire field of environmental research. Professor Levin earned his undergraduate degree in mathematics from Johns Hopkins University in 1961 and his PhD degree, also in math, from the University of Maryland in 1964. In 1965, he joined Cornell University where he became a professor of applied mathematics and ecology in 1977. While at Cornell, he also served as director of Cornell's Ecosystems Research Center, director of Cornell's Center for Environmental Research, and director of Cornell's program on theoretical and computational biology. In 1992, he moved to Princeton. In addition to his teaching role there, he led Princeton's Environmental Institute, and since 2001, he has directed Princeton's Center for Biocomplexity. Professor of Levin is a, number, is a member of a number of professional societies and advisory boards, including the science boards of the Santa Fe Institute and Israel's Institute for Medical Biomathematics. He is the chair of the Council for the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. He is also the editor-in-chief of the Princeton series in theoretical and computational biology and a member of the editorial or advisory boards of over a dozen scientific journals. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Philosophical Society, and he is a fellow both of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Among his many awards are the 2001 Akira Okubo Lifetime Achievement Award, the 2004 Dr. A.H. Heineken Prize for Environmental Sciences, the 2005 Kyoto Prize in Basic Sciences, and most recently, the 2007 American Biological Sciences Distinguished Scientist Award. Professor Levin is also the author of Fragile Dominion, Complexity in the Commons, a book that has been called a must-read for all those concerned with the human future. Please join me in welcoming 
Professor Simon Levin to our stage. Thanks very much. I very much appreciate the invitation to be here, and I appreciate all of you who have, uh, have come um, to hear what I have to say. So I don't think it's going to be news to anyone that our environment um, is at risk. We are facing a suite of global environmental problems, largely of our own doing. Temperatures are rising. So is atmospheric carbon dioxide. I mean, this dramatic uh, picture for which I thank uh, Peter Brewer showing atmospheric uh, CO2 and the sudden jump in, in the last uh, 25 years and, a, and a, to go along with it, a drop in ocean pH that's equally dramatic. We're losing species and biological diversity at a frightening pace. We read about, we know about new and emerging infectious diseases that are posing greater and greater threats to our society. Antibiotic resistance is on the rise. And even though there's scientific consensus on many of these environmental issues, especially re related to climate change, the action to deal with them, as I think you will agree with me, to date been sorely insufficient. And the reasons for this, I think, although we have much to learn about the science, are not that we don't know what the causes are, that we don't understand the science, that we don't know what to do. The primary limitations are not scientific. They are, to a large extent, due to the willingness of people to do what they need to do and governments to commit to the common good. In other words, to cooperate in finding solutions that benefit everyone. The reasons are that we discount. We discount the future. This is not a self-portrait. <laughs> we discount the future and we discount the interests of others. Uh, ecological systems are what we call complex adaptive systems. Indeed, so are, as we've learned um, more about than we'd like to know in the last several weeks, so are socioeconomic systems. That is, they are systems that are made up of individual agents that are interacting with each other, taking into account their own selfish interests. And the results are macroscopic consequences um, that are collective consequences of these individual behaviors that we can't control and that feedback to affect all of us. This is unfortunately why we are facing serious global ecological and environmental problems. It's because individual agents act largely in their own self-interest, and they don't take into account the social costs, the consequences of their actions. This leads to what we call problems of the commons, which is part of my title. And let me give you some examples of commons problems. One of them I've already showed you was fisheries. We all take out of the oceans um, for our own uses things that belong to humanity at large. We take things out of aquifers and put things into aquifers. We put pollution into the air and into the water. These are common situations. The air and the water belong to everyone, but individuals and individual corporations don't take this into account adequately in their own actions. We may not tend to think about vaccine use as a commons problem, but it is very much because if the level of, uh, of risk associated with a particular disease is low enough, that the risks or costs of taking the vaccine exceed the costs of not doing so for the individual, then there would be an inclination for individuals not to utilize the vaccines. But this would reduce herd immunity. This would be a cost to society. And so there's a trade-off. This is very much a commons problem. So too with antibiotics. Excessive antibiotic use has led to a situation in which antibiotic resistance is rising. Uh, creating problems for all of us. So how do we change individual actions? One of the problems, as has been pointed out by many ecologists, but also many great economists, like Kenneth Arrow, one of the greatest economists of the last century, is that conventional markets don't work for dealing adequately for dealing with commons problems, because 
They don't protect the environment because they don't incorporate these externalities, these pub public goods aspects, the social costs. And the situation's even worse when the individual agents are not you and, uh, and me. They are countries, our own nation, which has not been uh, an enthusiastic participant in achieving a Kyoto Accord or some replacement for it, and this is how we're seen uh, in some of the press in the world. But again, it's a common situation. Every nation has its own selfish interests. Those nations interact with each other in the global commons. Their, um, their consequences, <coughs> sorry, their actions have to trade off the individual cost and benefits to their own country and the collective good of society. So the challenge is how do we achieve cooperation at the global level? And the problem that lies at the root of this is what's called the free rider problem, as uh, illustrated here. Uh, the idea that in a situation in which cooperation is the dominant theme, there's still a tendency for others to free ride on the system, not pay the costs that everybody else in society is paying. This is what actually won um, John Nash the Nobel Prize. The prototypical problem that uh, economists know well uh, and uh, is known in many other disciplines is known as the prisoner's dilemma. So the problem is this. An arrest is made of two suspects in, in, a, uh, in a robbery, and each one is placed in a separate room, and each one is told that there's enough evidence on them to put them away for two years, but that that, um, that sentence can be reduced if they will give additional information about the role that the other suspect has played. And therefore, if this is Dave, if he provides information about, um, about his cohort, then his sentence is reduced to one year, and his, but his partner goes to jail for five years. So there's a great tendency for Dave or for Henry, who's given the same choice, not to cooperate with each other if they had reached an agreement in advance and agreed to cooperate and not provide any information, they would both get off with 10 years, with two years rather, but both of them have an inclination to uh, an incentive to provide evidence, thereby getting their sentence reduced to one year. However, um, there's nothing stable about that, and once Henry is in prison, Henry has a great tendency to defect, and that will put both of them in jail for an even longer period, for three years. So this is the prisoner's dilemma. Everybody would be better off, that is everybody being Henry and Dave, if they cooperated with each other, but the system is not a stable one, so they both defect, and this is the only stable solution. It's what's called the Nash Equilibrium, uh, and it's the problem that faces us in dealing with common situations. It's one, it's what won for D John Nash the Nobel Prize. Cooperation loses. For public goods problems, this is the essential uh, difficulty. It's called the tragedy of the commons. It was first identified by William Forster Lloyd um, about two centuries ago, but it was made popular uh, by Garrett Hardin in an influential paper about 50 years ago. But despite this, we know that cooperation does arise in nature, um, and it arises in theory as well. Here's how uh, these two donkeys have resolved this problem. Uh, failing to cooperate gets them nowhere. They have a consultation and agree that they can do better uh, by cooperating. So how does cooperation arise in nature? Uh, as far as the commons problem is concerned, Garrett Hardin's solution was what's called mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon. How do we get there? How does cooperation arise in nature? Well, you heard in the introductory remarks um, that um, cooperative behavior is widespread in nature, uh, especially in the so-called haplodiploid insects, the bees, the ants, the wasps, and that this was something that troubled Darwin. I will come back to that. Even bacteria cooperate. In mid-April, my colleague and collaborator, um, Bonnie Bassler, will be here to talk to you about quorum sensing in bacteria. Bacteria secrete 
compounds that signal to other bacteria, including those of other species, that they're there. This gives information about how many individuals there are. This is, uh, allows individuals to detect quorums, and bacteria will turn on or turn off the production of various chemicals in response to this and aggregate into biofilms like the plaque on your teeth. This is cooperation among bacteria. My colleague John Bonner is one of the first to really develop an understanding of the cellular slime mold, a collection of amoebae, which live in solitary states, but at some stage begin to signal each other. And that signaling leads to an aggregation process. Eventually, the aggregation process produces a, a slug that moves along, stops at a point, stands up on end, and produces spores that then seed the next generation. One of the great um, problems in understanding the evolution of the cellular slime mold is understanding why any cells would want to be at the front of the slug. Because the ones at the front of the slug end up being the stalk cells and don't reproduce. So this is cooperation and not entirely understood. But the classical examples involve the honeybees, the bees, the ants, the wasps. And it was something that did indeed puzzle Charles Darwin. Uh, in fact, he said it was one special difficulty which at first appeared to me to be insuperable and actually fatal to my theory. He later came up from, with some explanations for it, but it wasn't until much later that we really began to understand this, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Darwin was so worried about this problem that it delayed his publication of The Origin of Species for 20 years. The brilliant population geneticist J.B.S. Haldane was asked uh, in the early part of the last century, whether he would lay down his life for his brother. And he said, no, he wouldn't do that, but he would lay down his life for two brothers. <laughs> or for eight cousins. <laughs> Calculating the um, genetic relatedness that he sh uh, shared with, uh, with his relatives. W.D. Hamilton, who died tragically a few years ago from malaria, um, carried out the analysis for the social insects. Now, the, 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 the bees, the ants, the wasps are what we call haplodiploid. That means that the males come from unfertilized eggs. And in particular, that means that um, males are haploid. They only have one copy of the gene. Females are diploid. And if we have a mating between a male and a female, we get two kinds of offspring. But notice that all of, this, all of the offspring, all of the sisters, these are sisters because they come from fertilization, all of them share the same gene from the, from the father, and they have a 50-50 chance of sharing the same gene from the mother. So if you consider two sisters, on the average, they'll be related at, at three, in, in terms of three quarters of their genes, whereas um, each of you would be likely, every female here will share one half of her genes with her sister. If you were a haplodiploid insect, you'd be fortunate to share three quarters of your genes with your sister. So that makes genetic relatedness higher, and that means that if a female gives up her own fitness, her own reproductive output, to help her sister, who's the reproductive queen, then she gets a much higher percentage of her genes into the next generation. So haplodiploidy was an explanation for much of this highly social behavior. But there are many species that are eusocial, that have this highly social structure, and are not haplodiploid, like the termites. This is a picture my wife took when we were in Kruger National Park. This is a termite mound. Termites are highly social, but they're not haplodiploid. Naked mole rats are highly social, but they're not haplodiploid or attractive. Uh, <laughs> So cooperation does not require very close genetic relatedness. Here you see cooperation between a Cape buffalo and an ox picker sitting on its back, picking stuff off the back of the Cape buffalo and living on it. So this is a, a, a mutualism, a cooperative relationship between two very distant species. Reciprocal altruism, 
you help me, I'll help you. You scratch my back or pick the nits off of me and I'll pick them off of you. Facilitates cooperation and it's well known in many species, especially among primates. And in fact, all that's really needed is repeated interactions among individuals, even unrelated individuals, to develop cooperative relationships. It, it helps if they live in the same neighborhood. Uh, but in ways, in, in, in these sorts of ways, groups can escape from pr prisoner's dilemma and evolve cooperative relationships. But you see the difficulty if they're not living in the same neighborhood. So cooperation is easily explained in small groups. But how is cooperation sustained in larger groups like, like our societies? How do we develop cooperation? And can we extend these principles to the global level? Um, I, I was struck, actually, by how quickly, not that it's been that effective, but uh, how quickly the, the G8 countries and the G20 countries came together and were able to agree upon, upon common solutions to the economic problems that have faced us the last couple of weeks. Society sustained cooperation um, to a large extent through things called social norms, about which I'll say a great deal more. And those social norms often evolve into laws and they also have the potential for major shifts. One good example is foot binding in China. You all know that Chinese women had their feet bound. This was a social norm. There were uh, penalties of sorts if uh, women did not uh, participate in this. And yet, although this was a very stable practice over a long period of time, um, it disappeared suddenly. Social norms can be beneficial to others, like the fact that we give charities or sustain um, principles against violence in our society, uh, respect for others, but they can also be harmful, like caste systems and overconsumption, which lead to many of our environmental problems. So social norms contribute to environmental problems because they drive consumption, but they also hold the key to the solutions to these problems through the spread of new attitudes. So whereas social norms are part of the problem, our hope is by understanding social norms and how they spread and why people do what they do and consume what they, they do, uh, we have the mechanisms that allow us uh, to influence behaviors in the common good. This has happened. That we've seen dramatic changes in social norms uh, in this country in terms of attitudes towards things like recycling, uh, smoking in public, gender equality, racial equality, even population growth. Do we have the potential to understand how to apply these to these even more serious uh, problems. All of these norms that uh, become instituted involve rewards and punishment, and ultimately they may lead to um, their codification in laws and economic instruments. So social norms are maintained through tight interactions among individuals. They're sustained uh, against novel influences, and then occasionally a sudden phase transition can take place as new innovations gain ground and displace these old norms. Whenever we're dealing with the problems of the commons, we're dealing with the dynamics of collective phenomena. So this wonderful movie given to me by Claudio Carrari relates to a topic of, that I've been spending a lot of time on, which is understanding animal swarming. This is a starling uh, group in Rome, and you may have noticed a hawk that was causing all of this damage. There's the hawk in the middle. So this is a classical problem of collective phenomena. Um, let me run it for you again because it's... Uh, individuals are responding only to their own nearest neighbors or to local information. And nonetheless, we see these dramatic fluid dynamical sorts of patterns that emerge from this. This is a classical collective phenomenon. And collective behavior of this sort is well known and widespread in animal species. These are wildebeest. This is a front pattern in the Serengeti uh, of a wildebeest herd. None of these wildebeests is setting out to produce this spectacular pattern, um, but they are just responding to individuals in their neighborhood, responding to the vegetation, and remarkable patterns of this sort emerge. It's a problem that um, has been addressed for a wide variety of organisms, for fish and birds, um, for ungulates like I just showed you, for slime molds, for bacteria, for insects, for marine invertebrates, but also now for trying to understand societies and economies. 
How do collective consequences of individual actions lead to stock market crashes and hopefully recoveries? How do they lead to changes in social norms? How do they lead to our environmental problems? Well, at the core is that individuals imitate each other's behavior. And it, I think it's pretty obvious that they do this from the earliest ages. And as a result of that, the collective dynamics leads to patterns of uniformity, uh, social norms, uh, and uh, patterns that become difficult to change. It doesn't take much coupling to achieve a great deal. This is uh, Christian Huygens, the great physicist, who among his other achievements made pendulum clocks. And he noticed that when those clocks were placed, uh, for example, on boats, they tended to synchronize with each other. And he suggested some experiments which had been forgotten to a large extent, but have been reproduced by a number of individuals recently. This is my friend and colleague, Tim Buckman, in the middle, who was the chief of trauma surgery at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. And his particular interest in these sorts of systems, which may seem quite far away from what I've been talking about, is that it frustrates him that his colleagues tend to deal with patients one organ at a time. Um, one thing goes bad, they treat that, but then something else goes bad. He argues that the organism is a system with the organs closely coupled together. So he set out to reproduce Huygens' experiment. And once I show this to you, many of you will probably have seen this already, but I promise you, you'll never forget it. So what Tim did is to take five, pendul five metronomes with similar but different periods. They sit on a board, but they're quite independent of each other. He lifts up the board and puts it on two Coke cans, and that begins to set up a vibration. That vibration then begins to couple together the metronomes. There's still some independent metronomes, that like, like this one here, that try to get out of line. But it doesn't really have a chance. So it takes very little coupling to, um, this is um, a study by a mathematician in terms of coupled oscillators, to link together uh, diverse um, parts of a society. And, um, it doesn't take much more than imitation in societies to drive collective changes in human behaviors. Many of you will be familiar, at least with this book, The Tipping Point, which documented many of this, for, for a popular audience, many of the changes uh, that take place in our society. So we set out to model those. The simplest model of this is called the voter model. The voter model is a stochastic cellular automaton. The idea is that every individual here has a certain preference. Every individual picks a neighbor at random, and with a certain probability adopts whatever the preference is that the neighbor has. This model is not much different than the icing model of ferromagnetism, in which um, on a lattice, one has sites that are either spin up or spin down, and with a certain probability, change in relationship to their neighbors. That re eventually re leads to the magnetization of the whole structure. And in the voter model, at least in two dimensions, if you, if you assume that individuals have no intrinsic preference for candidate A or candidate B, but simply census their neighbors, eventually you get complete uniformity in the whole population. So it demonstrates how quickly these sorts of local innovations can spread through the population. Rick Durrett and I, Rick is a, pop, uh, a probabilist at Cornell, set out to model, it, to model social change with a somewhat more complicated model. This is the so-called threshold voter model. And basically what it says is, I change my opinion not by choosing a random neighbor, but I census my neighbors. And I only change my opinion if the number of neighbors uh, is above some threshold. What that threshold is turns out to be very important. And how those thresholds get set um, is something I'll come back to at the end. So, for applying these sorts of ideas to studying the dynamics of decisions in human populations, we have to put this in a broader context. How are individuals' decisions affected by the social context they find themselves in? How does the social context, including 
how these norms are enforced emerge and evolve? How does leadership arise? And how does it affect transitions? And how do collectives arise, groups, and interact with other collectives? As far as the leadership issue, Ian Cousin, who was my postdoc and now is my colleague at Princeton, and I, with some colleagues, set out to study the role of leadership in fish. But the idea was this was to be a model for understanding leadership much more generally in, in animal groups, but also with implications for opinion dynamics in human societies. So the model is a very simple one, and I'm going to present it to you as a model of um, movement in a three-dimensional space, but I'd like you to think about it in, in terms of its potential extension uh, or analogies with opinion dynamics in human societies. So this is an individual-based model. Every fish has a certain velocity vector associated with it. That velocity vector, uh, vector describes how it moves. And at each time step, each fish changes the direction it moves in relationship to information about its neighbors and about its environment. But every fish has a different set of rules that it uses. So it takes into account how close it is to its neighbors, whether it wants to move towards them or away from them, whether it wants to align itself with them. But it also takes into account its intrinsic information vector, this G. And it weights them in the following way. And you can think of this fish, say, as the trendsetter and um, this fish as the copier. Every fish updates its velocity vector at each time step by, um, and this is the only mathematics I'll put in here, a weighted average of its social vector and its information vector. If omega here is zero, then all this fish does is copy and move, for example, in the same direction as other individuals. If omega is infinite, the fish pays no attention to anybody else. So you might think about uh, people you know, maybe even leaders you know. Uh, <laughs> Um, in some of the work, we allow omega to be adaptive, which means if you're going in a, and the fact that you're going in this direction doesn't mean it's the right direction. It's important to point out. If um, we allow omega to be adaptive, that is, if I think I should be going in this direction and nobody's going along with me, then I reduce omega and I become more of a follower. But some individuals don't have an adaptive omega in our models. And again, I won't press those uh, analogies. So this is what happens if we have 100 individuals. And by the way, um, if I ever say I here, I really mean we. It's work with Ian Cousin. If I say we, I usually mean he. <laughs> uh, so there are 100 individuals here, only one of whom knows where it wants to go, and it's up here. And as you can see, the group moves, but very slowly in that direction. The other 99 are just diffusing around and pulling that individual back in. That's one informed individual. If I change that one informed individual to five, then it takes a while for those five to get out on the front. But eventually, they lead the group up to the right. If I change the five to 10, then the group moves dramatically, rapidly, almost as efficiently as you could off to the front. So one thing we find from these simple models is it takes very few individuals to lead a group, whether we're talking about fish uh, moving in, in real space, or we're talking about individuals moving in opinion space. What this graph shows is, is how efficiently you move towards the goal, how accurately, in relationship to the, perform, the proportion of individuals who are informed. In other words, the proportion of individuals who think they know which way we should be going. And what, this is a larger group here, and what this shows you is by the time you get up to 10 or 20 percent, all groups are moving uh, quite efficiently in that direction. Indeed, the reason for this dependence is because if all I look at is the number of informed individuals, then by the time I get to five or 10, independent of the group size, the move, group moves about as efficiently as it can up to the right. Now, what happens, you may ask, if not everybody thinks they should be going the same direction? So here I show you what happens if five individuals want to go here and five here and the other 90 are just following along. If the difference is not too great, the group splits the difference. But as it moves along, eventually the difference becomes large, and we get a bifurcation 
where the group goes either here or it goes here, or it, it may split. In fact, in some cases, we find that as the group moves up towards this uh, target, those individuals who think they want to go here are no longer all pointing in the same direction, uh, and the group will start, turn around and start moving down here. In fact, it may go back and forth. There is an analogy here with uh, political systems in which um, it ought to be the case that the party that's out of power, um, those individuals in that party are more, are more uniform in their direction, so everybody's moving in the same direction, but the model doesn't always uh, carry over very well to political systems. Um, now, these are models that have been developed for animal groupings. They work pretty well for describing animal groupings. Can we extend these simplistic insights that we get out of these to human groups? Um, how much does this herd behavior explain? If we're dealing with the dynamics of opinions in human societies, we have to take into account not just imitation, but the fact that we can make calculations, that we communicate with each other, that we learn. Um, there is the role of leadership and the role of enforcement. So I want to come to these topics now. Uh, Durrett and I went back and began to build slightly more complicated models. And now the idea is that um, individuals do not simply sample neighbors at random and take their opinions. They select neighbors or people with whom they share things. And um, that may be people of their own religion, their own ethnicity, their own political party. So the idea is that I'm a focal individual, and I meet Dick during the day, and I assess our similarity in terms of these labels, and I also census him on his attitudes or opinions on various issues that are often correlated with these labels. And then if there's one opinion that I'm not sure of, I may decide to change my opinion based on how much he and I agree at those other labels. So we tend to census individuals and decide to change our attitudes or opinions based on the degree of similarity we have with them. Um, we also allow in our model that, in, so we reproduce that in this probabilistic model. Individuals are identified with, by this bit string. They meet each other on a network and they change their opinions with a probability that depends on their degree of similarity. We also allow on a slower time scale that individuals may change their political party or their religion. It's a little hard for them to change their ethnicity, but these labels are things that are much slower variables. They create the viscosity in the society. And at some point, if I find, for example, that I'm in total disagreement with what my political party believes, I change parties. Uh, unless I'm Zell Miller. Um, and in this, in this model, the population, we can show this is a simple model with, with two different parties and two opinions, but individuals become organized into groups. The society splits into subgroups. Each one of those subgroups, oh, I wanted to mention that we've done this not only on grids, but on other sorts of networks, like this so-called small world networks, familiar to many, many of you as a Kevin Bacon network. If you're mathematicians in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the audience, you'll know about Paul Erdos, who was thought to be at the center of a graph of uh, individuals writing papers together, and Kevin Bacon mistakenly thought to be at the center of a graph of individuals who, who appear in the same movie, since apparently he's been in an infinite number of movies. So we reproduce, reproduce this on other sorts of networks. So it, all it takes is imitation to lead to the formation of stable groups. But once those groups form, the opinions and attitudes that go along with them get bundled together as what are often called frozen accidents, meaning there's no way to have predicted in advance which opinions would be associated with which parties, and therefore sudden shifts are possible. This was the electoral map in 1944, blue states and red states, and you can see the only, um, this was when Roosevelt won, but the only states that uh, went Republican were basically in the, in the uh, near, near West, I don't know what you call that region. Um, but by 1948, things were changing a little bit. The states' rights parties began to pick off some states in the South, 
1952, the map looked very different. The red states dominated most of the country, and the only bastion left to the Democrats was the southeast, the, those blue states. By 1964, the situation had flipped completely, and what was blue was red, and what was red was blue. This was 1952. This is 1964. Sudden shifts are possible, and as you can see, there's, it's not quite a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping of what was blue to what was red, but it's pretty close. Once those groups form, they can produce, because there are benefits to belonging to a group, they can enforce communal norms, like the fact that I'm wearing a tie and up here sweating uh, in a jacket. It's not because I like to do that, but it's, it's my tribute to, um, uh, to the society in which I operate. So, uh, foot binding was another example of this. And we see this in many examples of dress in many societies and other sorts of phenomena, like uh, body tattoos. Because those groups provide collective benefits to membership, that can begin to lead for selection for the mechanisms that stabilize groups. Um, higher thresholds, for example, don't go and interact with people in that group over there, uh, and to intergroup conflict. So a lot of the cooperation that we understand um, and how it's evolved in human societies is to allow groups to perform better in competition with other groups. Go back to what, um, um, to what Garrett Hardin said, that the solution to the commons problem was mutual coercion mutually agreed upon. Is this the only way we can get cooperation? Does cooperation require an enemy, even if it's an interstellar uh, enemy? No, there's evidence that um, is emerging of how other, what's called other regarding behavior uh, can arise. One example of this is called the ultimatum game. Um, in the ultimatum game, I give this gentleman here, I offer him $100,000, and he has to share it with this gentleman over here whom he doesn't know and he will never see again. Now, everybody knows the rules of the game. It's a one-time uh, one interaction. And um, the rules of the game are that, uh, that uh, this gentleman here can make whatever offer he wants. He can offer you $1. He can offer you $90,000. I play this game in my class, and um, I, I offer one student $100,000, who, of course, doesn't believe me. And uh, he has to share it with another student and offers $30,000, which he thinks is a fair price. She rejected it. And I said to her, it's costing you $30,000 to reject it. She said, yes but it's costing him $70,000. So um, this, is, this phenomenon has, there, there are some students, of course, who say I'll take a dollar, and obviously the, the result depends on whether they really think I'm going to produce the money and on how large the, the amount is. But this has been studied by anthropologists and social scientists in a variety of societies, and they do find that individuals don't behave in the way that economists would expect them to behave. After all, there's no reason for him at all to have t to turn down $100 or $1,000. He knows if he turns it down, neither one of them gets anything. Did I forget to tell you that? <laughs> all right, let's start over again. I, I give this gentleman $100,000. I just realized that. He shares it. If you turn it down, neither one of you gets anything. That's, that's an important part of the rules. Um, so... He should never turn down $100 or $1,000, but individuals will reject um, splits that they regard as unfair or inadequate. Now, from your point of view, you've got two considerations. One is a fairness consideration, and the other is a game theoretic one as to whether you think he will accept. You only, you're playing a different sort of situation. You're not involved in a game. You're only dealing with the fairness issue. So this game has been played in a variety of different cultures, and there are big cultural differences. The mean offer varies from societies. For example, in the eastern U.S., it's about 41 percent. In Spain, it was as low as 27 percent. This is a study by Oosterbeek et al., but there have been various studies carried out of this sort. 
The mean rejection rate varies a great deal among cultures. You see in Kenya, 4% is the mean rejection rate. Now this obviously, again, depends on the total amount that's involved. So this is very much culturally dependent. We have evolved these norms of fairness, of what one thinks is a fair amount to offer. Gene Ensminger at um, Caltech and others have set out to study a different game, therefore, to try to remove this, some of the components of this game. They play a game called the dictator game. In the dictator game, everything's exactly the same. The offer is made, but you don't get the choice. So now, you, you have no choice, and your only consideration is fairness. And what's found often, this is what generally would, in those cultures was the mean acceptable offer, and people will often offer more in the dictator game than they do in the ultimatum game. Because now they're told, well, it's only your sense of fairness. It's no longer a game. Uh, Emory students have made their way in here um, as well. Ernst Fair, a behavioral economist at, um, uh, in Europe, set out to do a set of experiments to test individuals' tendencies to be charitable and how these charitable norms are sustained. And what he did is he had a group of students in a room, or a group of subjects in a room, and he gave each one of them um, a fixed amount of money, which they could either use on themselves, or they could use charitably to donate to a common pool, or they could use to punish other individuals. Now, this was a game that was played repeatedly. Um, everybody knew what everybody else had done, and initially, individuals were quite selfish. But other individuals began to punish them. Most individuals punished other individuals who, um, who had not been charitable. Some individuals actually punished charitable individuals. But there are always these anomalies. Now, punishment is something that costs the individual because I've got a fixed amount of resource. I could spend it on myself. I could spend it to punish you. One unit for me punishes you three units. But why should I ever do that? Um, so we learn from this that humans will punish others who deviate from social norms, and that this is an important part of how norms are sustained, even at cost to themselves. Punishment itself becomes a norm. This is like a second-order norm. You have a responsibility to punish, and it can evolve from repeated interactions. There's also been work recently about uh, trying to understand whether second-order punishment is, is a strong force. It appears not to be. That would be individuals punishing individuals who don't punish um, selfish individuals. The maintenance of cooperation in our societies depends on uh, shared and mutually agreed upon norms. Uh, people like Eleanor Ostrom at Indiana have pioneered studies of how individuals manage fisheries, how do they maintain the stability of common property resources by distributed systems of um, control. Steve Lansing at the University of Arizona has studied the water temples of, ba of Bali. Bali had a very complicated water temple, uh, I'm sorry, water distribution system that was embedded in the religious structure of the society um, and was entirely self-organized. The government realized this, this was a very inefficient system and came in with a top-down modeling approach to try to redistribute the resources the society collapsed. Uh, and uh, they eventually had to reinstitute the bottom-up approach. Again, mutually agreed upon distributed control within a strong social context is what worked best. Many social norms, like the ones that I've been talking about, can only be understood when we embed them in some broader context. Charitable giving, for example, uh, the ultimatum game, and the experiments of Ernst Fair. Why do individuals do these things that economists wouldn't expect them to do? It's because they have developed heuristics, senses of fairness, um, that um, sustain the, the social norms and the social structure of the society. We're only beginning to understand how those are sustained. Um, if I go in to, um, to buy a car and I expect to pay $30,000 for it, and it ends up being 30000 and 30, I figure that's in the noise. If I go in to buy a cup of coffee, which I expect to be $3 and it's $33, uh, then I'm offended. I won't pay the extra $30. Same $30, but somehow I have reduced the calculation to a heuristic 
a sense of fairness that tells me when I should accept or reject certain things. We develop those, those um, heuristics because we often have to make decisions in situations much more rapidly than we have time to make the calculation, so we embed the examples um, in a broader context of a set of similar situations. Indeed, it may not be simply the speed that we can't carry out, but the fact that we don't know how to make the calculation or don't have the confidence to make the calculation. In many situations where you need to make decisions, how often do you ask yourself, did I do the right thing? If I've lost money in the stock market, did I at least do what I'm supposed to be doing? Um, will you feel better about it? If, if, you, um, if you engage in, there, there are um, well-known examples of um, experiments in which economists ask people the following sort of, um, of question. There's a lake with some ducks. We'd like to protect the lake and the ducks how much would you contribute to that? Um, the answer is, let's say, $100. Now you go to a similar group of individuals and you say, there are 10 lakes, each as large as the first lake. We'd like to protect them. How much would you contribute to that? The answer is $100. It's what's called the warm, fuzzy feeling. Individuals have translated what they think their obligation is. It's about them. It's no longer related to the outcome. Historical effects, of course, can be important as well, and many of our behaviors represent our evolutionary pasts. But my main argument is that in order to understand how individuals behave in these situations, we can't restrict ourselves to the particular context of the ultimatum game or to Ernst Fair's experiments. We have to embed them into a context in which you don't know what game you're going to be playing. Uh, it's a metagame situation and you're told you have to develop a strategy which works well on the average, but may not be the best one in a particular situation. That's why we get the anomalous behaviors um, in things like the ultimatum game. People are embedding it in a broader social context. Even though he knows he'll never see him again, he knows he'll see somebody like him, and this is part of the fabric of society. And where do the leaders come from? Uh, how do power structures emerge? And finally, even more difficult is understanding the role of groups and institutions. What this says is, hey, buddy, are you familiar with the term birds of a feather? How do individuals become organized into groups? How do those groups become maintained? Um, and uh, how are they sustained? My colleague, uh, Anthony Appiah, talks about what he calls the other, the fact that uh, the greatest conflicts occur often among societies and peoples who have been close together historically. There's no reason for, for enmities have to have developed among groups that have never been in contact with each other. Um, so do we need the other? And often these norms become formalized into, uh, into laws. Often when I talk about these sorts of things to, to economists, they say, well, climate, getting, changing attitudes towards climate change, changing attitudes towards other environmental issues, is only going to happen if you have laws that enforce this. But my argument in response is, but you can't create those laws. You can't in introduce a carbon tax, for example, until you've created the, um, the, the feeling in society that the society is ready for it. You have to change the normative structure of society. The problem is that in the global commons, there is no other. This famous cartoon of Pogo says, it's hard walking on this stuff. Yep. Son, we have met the enemy and he is us. And so we don't have another. Um, we can't depend on co cooperative mechanisms that have evolved in order to, to deal with conflicts with other groups. Addressing these sorts of questions is going to require new partnerships among biologists, economists, social scientists, decision makers, partnerships that have never um, been developed before. Uh, we have the director of the National Science Foundation here tonight, and the Science Foundation has been find, trying to find ways to encourage interdisciplinary interactions and partnerships among people who haven't worked with, together before. Most fundamental, I hope I've convinced you, is the issue of cooperation and how to influence individual behaviors in the common good. Ultimately, the solutions to these problems are going to require the development 
of mechanisms of trust and cooperation. Trust doesn't necessarily mean you like the other person. Uh, one of the most successful international agreements is the Montreal Protocol on Chlorofluorocarbons, um, which has built in many mechanisms that um, ensure the participants' behavior. So individuals, individual participant nations know what other nations are going to do, not because those other nations are ones they necessarily like, but because the, the protocol is written in such a way that you can trust that you know what the others are going to do. But ultimately, it has to be done so that everybody is made to feel they have something to gain and that we can achieve a sustainable future for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you very much. We have the opportunity for a few questions from the audience. I believe there are microphones in the aisles. If uh, this fascinating talk has prompted you to have some questions about all these remarkable games uh, that you'd like to learn more about, is a, a chance to ask some questions. Please. I'm not quite sure how to phrase this. Um, I'm thinking, you know, just with the, kind of touching on it a bit in your, um, your comments, um, when you have to make decisions, both individually, nationally, globally, um, in the glare of the moment. How does that affect, what, what effect um, do you see that coming up with? Maybe not so much in the ecological, maybe I'm thinking a little more on the economic side, but certainly when people have to make decisions now or in a very short period of time in a very public way, how, how does that play out? Okay, I, that's actually a very good question because I think it relates to what I was talking about at the end in the sense that I think that when people are put in a, uh, are forced to make a decision very rapidly, uh, and this is made even stronger by if, if they're done it with, with the glare of everybody watching them, then there's a tendency to fall back on what the social norm is, an unwillingness to, to break ranks. I mean, we see this uh, to a large extent in the presidential debates in which individuals give answers that they think are least likely to generate uh, negative responses. Um, I've managed together with Tim Buckman and the help of the McDonald Foundation to organize um, a, a small group that's been meeting to discuss the role of social norms in, um, in understanding health care and in particular how doctors make decisions. Why do some doctors um, prescribe antibiotics right away and others don't? prescribed cesarean sections versus not, et cetera. What, and the answer to, to many of those um, questions is that, there, is that the social norms provide a context and a protection against litigation, indeed, so that um, it, if you want to change prescribing behaviors in, in terms of antibiotics, you have to change the, um, the norms of the society. Because if, if you take your child into the doctor and say, I think she's got an ear infection, I want antibiotics, and the doctor doesn't think the child has an ear infection, he may still give you antibiotics just to shut you up. <laughs> and also, making the calculation that um, if I give antibiotics and they're not needed, there won't be any consequences. If I fail to, um, and, um, and something bad goes wrong, then I'm subject to litigation, I'd like to be able to fall back against standard practice. Um, and I think we do that, that's an extreme example, but I think we do that um, in many situations. We make calculations uh, and make decisions that fit most easily within this, the social structure. But we also make decisions, we also create for ourselves our own social structure, if you will, our own heuristics that say this is a situation uh, type A situation, type B situation, and type A situations, I do this, I take this amount of risk, et cetera. So I, I think it's a, it, um, it's a very strong aspect. Yeah. Please. Okay. Um, most of the experiments that you just spoke of uh, took into account the part that religions and society play. Have you ever considered conducting an experiment by grouping people by their personality profile, for example, using the Myers-Briggs test? 
I don't know what that. <laughs> um, the I don't actually do the experiments, but the, my my colleague Debbie Prentice, who who uh, um, who does these experiments, um, just gave a talk the other day in, in which she described. I don't, she wasn't using that test, but in which she would characterize people in terms of of their degree of dominance, those sorts of personality features. So those sorts of experiments are. are those sorts of criteria are often in the background in partitioning um, people into these um, categories. Um, she, she actually des de described, um, I, I think it's okay to talk about this, I'm trying to decide whether this is published work, but, <laughs> but um, she's done experiments with students in which they are presented with uh, individuals who exhibit different degrees of dominance. Uh, they make statements like, um, I'm the smartest in the class and um, I did the best, I, I'm sure I'll do the best on the exam. From there down to others who, who feel somewhat insecure. And individuals read these statements out and then student subjects are asked to respond to this. The only way they respond to this is by um, electrodes that are, uh, um, that are placed on their face to measure muscular movements to tell whether they're smiling or sneering. It would have been interesting to do this last night <laughs> during the debate. Some of this can be, can be done uh, indirectly. Uh, but it's, it, it, first of all, it's quite interesting um, how individuals respond to, um, to degrees of dominance. There's a difference as to whether the dominance is being expressed by males or females. And there's a difference between whether it's males or females that are perceiving, and it's a different, there's a difference between whether the individuals that are perceiving are dominant or not. Uh, there are a whole, it, it, there's a fascinating um, diversity of, of experiments of this sort that can be done, um, and uh, taking into account who, who's doing the response, the personality, in other words, of the individuals um, responding would be a, is, a, is a terrific sort of thing to do. Well, let me uh, thank you all for joining us this evening, and uh, could, let's all join in expressing our appreciation to Professor Salini. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you all at a future Capital Science Lecture. <laughs>